At this stage, we'd also like to welcome all of our internet audience. Uh, we are once again streaming live, and of course, the message will be available on our YouTube channel in the future to, uh, as it were, watch on demand as uh, people are able to do so. I'm going to pray right now, and we will really trust God once again that uh, uh, God will uh, speak a fresh word into our lives, that we receive fresh manner this morning. Shall we do that? All right. Heavenly Father, at this time, we commit this time to you, commit ourselves to you. And Lord, we just uh, thank you that, uh, Lord, you're on the throne. We thank you, Lord, that your word is living and powerful, uh, Lord, that it's always fresh. And we thank you, Lord God, that our spirits are being freed, our minds are being renewed, our hearts are being taught, and we thank you, Lord, that faith rises uh, as the Word of God is being ministered to us this morning. And Lord, we, as always, we commit to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. We're not here to have our ears tickled, but we're here to have our hearts changed and to become better equipped to serve you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, we are... Uh, partway into a series of messages entitled, How to Master Your Mind and Rule Your Own Life. How to Master Your Mind and Rule Your Own Life. Um, and so God really wants to speak to us about our mind right now. There is a focus on your mind and on my mind and what to do with our mind and for that matter, what not to do with our mind. And when we're talking about ruling our own life, we are talking about ruling our own life under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Um, if somebody is not under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, uh, they can't really properly rule their mind either because, as I say, the two go hand in hand. We submit our life to Jesus Christ, and then we are fully, we become in charge of our mind and, and of our lives, and we live the life that God has purposed for us. I'm going to briefly recap uh, some of the uh, things that we've already stated in the beginning, just to make sure that uh, we, we, we know what we are, uh, you know, what, what, what our springboard is, so to speak. And the key scripture that we're starting with is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. Everybody say completely. All right, so not just partially, but completely. He says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so uh, Paul the Apostle, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he tells us that we are a three-part being. Uh, uh, as it were, you know, uh, uh, three-part being, specifically being spirit, soul, and body. And we said that our spirit and our soul is the eternal part of us, and our body is the temporary part part of us. Uh, we will get a new body when we get to heaven, so that's okay. Um, and we said that our mind is uh, specifically made up of our, let me start again, our soul is made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. And then right at the beginning of these uh, messages there, we stated that our mind is the pivotal point of our lives. Pivotal in the sense that wherever our mind goes and keeps on traveling, that's eventually where our lives will end up. Um, we said that ruling and reigning in our life really begins by reigning in our thought life. It's taking charge in our thought life. Um, and we said that renewing our mind which is a process. You know, becoming born again is an event. It's like a one-time event, but renewing the mind is a process that goes on and on, uh, and that is done by replacing uh, our thoughts with God's thoughts. And the good thing is that God has communicated His thoughts through words, and we've got it written down in our Bible. So we can take God's thoughts and impress them on our mind and renew our mind. And we said that the Holy Spirit helps us uh, moment by moment to monitor our thinking, to monitor our thoughts, and to align them with God's thoughts. Um, and uh, this morning, I would like to speak to you about how to love God with your mind. How to love God with your mind. And some of you are already ahead, and you're already reading in Mark chapter 12, verse 29 and verse 30. And these are the words of Jesus. Uh, Jesus was one day approached by one of the 
Jewish leaders at the time, and they said, what, what is the first commandment? What is the, what is the first commandment? Uh, because you have, you know, the Bible is a big book, um, and there's a lot of things in there, and it's good to categorize things and to lay things out in a kind of a logical sort of a way. And, uh, and Jesus was asked uh, this question, and it says here in verse 29 that Jesus answered him, and he said, the first of all the commandments is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And verse 30, here it says, And you shall love the Lord your God. So the first commandment is to love God. He says, You shall love the Lord your God. He says, With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first command. And of course, if we had time, we will carry on in the next verse. He tells us the second commandment, um, uh, the second of all the, all the commandments, which is to love your neighbor is yourself. So two commandments we need to remember as number one, love God. Number two, love people. All right. Are you loving people? Oh, sorry. Uh, um, I should not have sprung that on you so quickly. So let's just back up again. Uh, let's start talk about the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now, many Christians have no issue with the command or with the concept of loving God with our heart. Um, what would not be uncommon is that when we would say, we would touch ourselves here and say, well, look, I really, really love you because we, we, love God, we, we love with our heart. But we think with our head, don't we? We love with our heart, but we think with our head. But now God tells us that we not only do think with our head, but we to love God with our head, love God with your mind. Because he says, love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. So how do you love God with all your mind? Again, we, we love with our heart, and when we point physically, we will usually just put our hands somewhere in the region of our, of our area where our physical heart is. And this is not talking about the physical heart. This is talking about the, our eternal part of us, our, about our spirit and our, our soul, if you like, collectively. But then he singles out our mind, and he says, Love God with all your mind. So we love with our heart. But we think with our head, we think with our mind, and he's telling us to love God with our mind as well. The Amplified Translation says here, with all your mind, with your faculty of thought. So again, many Christians, most Christians would not have a problem with the concept of loving God with our heart, but many of them have never figured out on how to love God with their head, how to love God with their mental capacity, or with their, what he calls here, the faculty of thought. Um, and so how do you love God with your faculty of thought? Uh, I'm just asking the question. We will have the answer a little bit later on in the message, but I'm just asking the, the question, how do you do that? Because after all, you know, Jesus is not wasting words. Uh, he's not wasting time. In fact, he's picking up a scripture over from the book of Deuteronomy, and he's, he's just basically stating what the word says. Jesus didn't make this up. Um, it's in the Word. Um, he basically quoted the Word to them. Um, and, uh, and, and the question is, how do you do that? Um, how do you love God with your faculty of thought, with your mind, which is part of your th soul, with your, how do you love God with your thinking? Um, and uh, I would like to cover that area uh, this morning and in the process, hopefully, that this is going to help us uh, to fulfill that scripture that we love God and we love people. Because we, we can love God with our mind, uh, but we also can love people with our mind. Uh, I mean, that's not enough, of course. You know, we still have to communicate uh, and so forth. But that's just an interesting uh, uh, concept here. Let me read to you from Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. And this is out of the Amplified Translation. I believe that that sheds some light on what we're discussing here this morning. Um, 
I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, when I read the Bible and it tells me to do something, and if I don't understand how to do this, it kind of frustrates me a little bit, thinking, well, God tells me how, you know, to do that. How do I do that? This is one of the reasons why, more often than not, when we, we teach and preach the Word, we bring how-to messages, how to do that. Not just, you know, you should or you ought to, but how do you do that? That's what I'm interested in. Um, And in Colossians 3 verse 2, it says, Set your minds and keep them set on what is above. So it says, set your mind and keep it set on what is above. And then it says in brackets, the higher things. Not on the things that are on the earth. The God's Word translation says, not on worldly things. Set your mind. Um, The Living Bible puts it this way, same verse. It says, let heaven fill your thoughts. Let heaven fill your thoughts. We've just had a, uh, a prayer meeting before the service, and I notice from time to time that uh, sometimes, you know, we're we're praying, but not everybody's always praying, and, and, you know, that's okay. You know, sometimes people sit there and they enjoy the atmosphere, and they are kind of in a reflective mold, if you like, and they're kind of just sitting there meditating on things. So you don't always know what they're meditating on, but you can see that they're enjoying what's going on because you can see a peaceful, a serene uh, kind of look on their face, and it seems to me that they're allowing heaven to fill their thoughts right now. All right? Of course, it's also possible to let hell fill our thoughts. You know, we can think heavenly thoughts, and we can think hellish thoughts. I want to make this, like, really simple. (laughs) All right? And I want to use some very basic terms so that, see, if I use basic terms, I can understand it. If it gets too sophisticated, I might be able to get my head around it. You know, sometimes we say we can think God thoughts and we can think devil thoughts. Thoughts that are inspired by God or thoughts that are inspired by the devil. So Colossians chapter 3 It contrasts, in fact, the whole chapter and the few verses preceding, contrasts between heavenly things and earthly or worldly things. It contrasts between the new life that we have in the Spirit as as opposed to the old life in the flesh. And Paul consistently, when he speaks to the believers there in the various cities, the various churches, he says, remember, you were, but now you are. You used to be, or you used to do, but now you're this. And he tells them that they're a new creation. He tells them they have a new life. He tells them there's a new way of living, new thoughts, new concepts, new ideas, new ways of doing things. And that's what... Paul is speaking about here. He says, let heaven now fill your thoughts and don't spend your time worrying about things down here. Now, of course, we have to deal with things down here. As we spoke last week very briefly, that, you know, there are earthly things that we have to deal with um, and there's natural things that we've got to take care of. Uh, You know, somehow we've got to plan for tomorrow and get ready so that our lives are organized and that that it's it's well run and everything. But he says, generally says, let heaven fill your thoughts. One of our earlier messages, we talked about the two kinds of wisdom that the Bible speaks about. There's the heavenly wisdom, and then there's the worldly wisdom. The spiritual wisdom or the soulish, the soulish, the mental, the the, uh, sensual type of wisdom. And that's really just another way of saying exactly The same thing here. And you and I can choose. We can go with our mind. We can swing this way. With our mind, we can swing that way. You might recall one of the first messages that Pastor Vanessa ministered and had the whiteboard up here. And she made reference to the fact that really our soul, our soul is a little bit like our soul, you know, sits in between the the realm of the spirit and the natural realm. And it's, it's like on a hinge. 
and it can swing this way and can swing that way. And, uh, and you and I determine which way it swings, and we shouldn't let it flop around by itself. <laughs> Aim it and keep it set. He says, set your mind and keep them set. It's a bit like, you know, being on a ship, on, on a boat. He says, set your rudder and keep it set. Don't sort of change your direction every five minutes. <laughs> and, and, and Paul goes on in verse 8. He says, he says, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. He's saying, that's part of the old. He says, put off the old and, and now put on the new. Get rid of all of this here. And uh, the question is, pe people say, well, how, how, how do I get rid of anger and, and rage and, and, and all of this other stuff? How, how, how do you do that? Well, you see, the way to get rid of anger and rage is to get rid of angry and rageful thoughts. That, that's the way to do it. And to think kind and peaceful thoughts instead. We can train ourselves to think different thoughts. And when another thought would want to arise, we bounce on it like a chicken would on a bug and just absolutely not deny it uh, uh, to just crawl around in our mind as it wants to. See, the way to get rid of maliciousness, slander, and foul language is to get rid of the thoughts of such things. And think lovely and pure thoughts instead. You know what, well, friends? Much of it has to do with the input. You know, the input determines the output. <coughs> Excuse me. While people feed on rubbish, you know, there will be rubbish output in their mind. Uh, and, you know, like there's, uh, there's certain things uh, that we should not watch, we should not read, we should not certain people we shouldn't hang out with because it all feeds the old. Um, and you know, like, uh, you know, programs on, say, television, they talk about gossip from Hollywood. Not interested. Not interested. Oh, guess who has got into bed with who? Not, not interested. Because, you see, if we feed on that, guess, guess what? Our minds will turn over and over and over, and we keep our mindset in that direction. Guess what's going to happen? in years to come, because as we say, that our mind is the pivotal point. And wherever our mind turns and keeps on set, you know, in that direction, that's where our life will eventually end up. So, friend, we could not have a mind filled with anger and rage and have a peaceful life. It can't be done. You cannot have a loose mind and a controlled mouth at the same time. Control begins in the mind. And somebody with a loose mouth has got a loose mind in the first instance. And as I say, sometimes people sort of make out, and we've said this before, it's like something pops out of their mouth. Oh, gosh, where did that come from? Well, it came from your mind. That's, that's where it came from. If it weren't in the mind, it wouldn't come out of your mouth. Your, your mouth is incapable of bringing forth things that are not in the mind in the first instance. You know, Jesus said, he says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Whatever is in our heart, in our mind, in abundance, that's what the mouth will spring, uh, you know, pour forth. In fact, in the NIV translation, uh, it says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is is full of. And the heart is a kind of a collective term there in terms of our mind and, our, and sort of whatever goes on in there, it says, will eventually pour forth. Um, you see, there are certain things that we feel passionate about. And then you get around people and you get them on their passion and they talk and talk and talk. Uh, why? Because that's what the, 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 their heart is full of. You see, you, you get around me and, and you start a conversation on, on, on politics. I, I can talk and talk and uh, I'm very passionate about this area. 
or you get around me and, 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 and talk about, you know, this is not just about, you know, spiritual things. I'm passionate about spiritual things, but just in the natural, having a conversation about something. You get around me and you start talking about, you know, like healthy living. I could talk for hours around healthy living and, and about healthy nutrition. And, I, and I, I think I could actually help people in this area if they were only interested, but a lot of people are not interested, which is fine. You know, it's fine. You get around others and they, they start on their passion. Well, why is that? That's, their, their heart is filled with that, so they speak uh, about that a lot. You see, if we change the content of the heart or the mind, then our mouth will speak differently. Here is a scripture in uh, Psalm 19, verse 14. The psalmist kind of praying and musing before the Lord. And, you know, these guys, they speak, they sing, they meditate, they speak out aloud, they speak to themselves, and then they prophesy, and all of that is kind of bundled together. But here he says, he says, he says Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. What's the meditation of my heart? That's my thought life. That's what sort of my thought life, my, my conversation that goes on uh, internally like all the time. And in fact, it really goes on all the time, doesn't it? Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's good to learn to, 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 to calm the mind down and to shut things down so that it's only a trickle rather than a constant flood of just thoughts, you know, running in all directions. And that's all part of controlling our mind, and it's all part of mastering our mind. But the psalmist here makes uh, a, an interesting statement. He says, may the words of my mouth be pleasing to you, and we would absolutely have no problem with that. But then he says, look, let the meditation of my heart also be pleasing to you. So in other words, uh, he, he knows that God knows what go, goes on in our mind. God knows our every thought. And certain thoughts don't please God. It's not because they're contrary to his word only, but God knows if we meditate on that thought long enough, it'll take us away from the purposes of God. God knows the future, and God knows what leads us from here to there to somewhere else because it all begins in the mind. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. In the New Century Version, it says, I hope my words and thoughts please you, O Lord. He says, I hope they please you. Well, we absolutely know that certain words that we speak will please God, and other words that we could speak that don't please God. We know that certain thoughts that we think will be pleasing to God, and other thoughts would not be pleasing to God at all. So, you see, God is pleased when we control our thought life and when we think godly thoughts. God's pleased by that. In fact, to answer our question that we had when we began to say, how do you love God with your mind? You see, to love God with our mind is done by eliminating thoughts that are contrary to His Word and to fill it with thoughts that are in line with His words. We're really not saying anything different to what we've already said. It's all about the renewing of the mind. Just renew the way we think. Renewing our mind. No longer thinking the thoughts that we used to think. It's taking charge in our thought life and not letting our mind race off and tear off in any old direction it wants to. Like we said in the beginning, you know, it's like a wild horse. You know, it's time to saddle up that horse and to put a bit in its mouth, as it were, and to say, no, 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 horse, we're not going left, we're going right. And no, 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 we're not galloping now. We're just gently trotting forward. We're just, you know, just, uh, you know, just even the speed of the mind, uh, let this thing uh, be controlled rather than it wants to do its own thing. Paul the Apostle spoke extensively around all of that because he knew and he understood 
what we've said in the beginning, that uh, our mind is the pivotal part of our lives. Wherever this thing turns and wherever it sets, whatever course that it uh, decides to be on, that will eventually be where our life will end up on. So he spoke into that again in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4 verse 8. He says, finally, so he's already spoken in chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, Spoken in chapter 4 a little bit, and it says, finally. So in other words, oh, by the way, guys, he says, like you're topping everything off. Look, I've said all of that to say this. He says, finally, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of a good report, if there's any virtue... If there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So don't meditate on other things. Meditate on these things. The King James Version says, think on these things. And uh, in the Amplified Translation, he says, think on and weigh and take account of these things and fix your minds on them. Fix your minds on them. Fix, not, don't just visit there, but fix your mind in that direction. You know, as I say, various vehicles and crafts have got different, you know, like uh, steering mechanisms. Um, aeroplanes got flaps and they've got the rudder at the back and this is how they steer so that they can fix their nose in a direction, and despite side currents, they will still end up where they set out to go. I'm, I'm not surprised or not amazed, you know, when I get on the plane, and we always end up getting to where we plan to go. So the pilot already knows how to set the gear wherever it needs to go. If you're in a ship, whether that's a little dinghy or whether that's a big ocean liner, it has a rudder. And this thing, there's currents out there in the, in the sea. There's currents uh, uh, that sometimes are very strong and the whole tidal thing going on, but still the ship ends up typically where it needs to go. I've never been able to figure out how they steer them air balloons because there's no, no rudder on an air balloon. It seems to me that they're completely left to the elements. If the wind blows in this direction, guess where the balloon goes. If the wind goes in that direction, guess where the balloon goes. And many people's minds is like a balloon. Whatever the current is at the time, whoever they're with at the time, that's where their mind is. <laughs> and, and that ought not to be. <laughs> and so, you know, largely... I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but largely I said before that input determines output. Uh, you know, people talk about, you know, they watch a movie and they enjoy it, and, uh, and, and I watch a movie and I enjoy it. Uh, and as in my type of uh, enjoyment, I, I don't like dramas personally. I don't watch a lot of dramas because it, they play with my mind and I don't like my mind sort of twisted and turned in that direction. And I particularly don't like it if there's a sad ending. I just want something reasonably happy. All right? Uh, because this thing will otherwise affect me and then I go away and then I think about it. Yeah, for me, a good movie is when I watch it, I enjoy it, I walk away and don't give it another thought. <laughs> so if it's an action movie, you know there's a car racing going on or somebody, they fly in a plane and they jump out or they've got an explosion over there and it sort of entertains me and a bit of a storyline to it and, uh, and then I walk away and don't give it another thought, uh, then I'm good with that. But as I say, you know, some of these twisting twists and turns, you know, it's a little bit like, you know, that program, and I don't even know if it's still on today, you know, the days of our lives, you know, people's problems, and like, oh, God, oh, to keep me away from that. Uh, uh, it's like, uh, I don't want to follow somebody's sob story and somebody's messed up life. And, and, you know, this is why I'm not listening to what celebrities are saying. Huh. <laughs> Celebrities, whether they're film stars, whether they're singers, or whether they're sports people, you know, a lot of them, to become celebrities, they're very good at what they do. But a lot of them are so messed up in their character 
and they're so messed up in their head, like I'm thinking, gosh, you know, you might be a, a big actor, but you're just completely unintelligent. Like, open your mouth, it's just completely unintelligent. You know, the word for that is dumb, <laughs> but I, I say unintelligent. Uh, and then they get up and they make these big statements. You know, they get involved in politics and they put their weight behind this one or that one. Say, so you're not going to sway me. Your celebrity status has no effect on my life whatsoever because I only listen to godly people and then, then I like listening to intelligent people. And you're not intelligent, so I'm not listening to you. So whatever they write, whatever they post, whatever they tweet, whatever they chirp, whatever, not interested. Uh, so I say, I, you know, as I say, I just, I just don't like to be swayed. I'm not one to run with the masses. You know, the masses are easily swayed. And don't you and I become part of the masses? Oh, you know, I tell you, there's a whole world there, friends. I'm really starting to preach now. There's a whole world here where people can tell you the name of every actor, of every singer, of every sports person, but they do not know the saints that have gone before us who've paid the price with their own lives to bring, to keep the Bible preserved for us so we can, and, and people that have fought to bring democracy into the Western world that we have got to fight to keep and to bring freedom of speech, which is almost getting lost. In everything that goes on where people's minds are played with and they're swayed this way and swayed that way. Whew, I wasn't going to go there because I know I go there and then I get all worked up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, praise God. Though there are some good people out there and cel that have celebrity status, some very good ones. But they're few and far in between. I was, I was a couple of times, it's like, you know, you hear these people and the comments they make is like, what planet are you on? Detached from reality. Messed up. Messed up. Some of them on their fifth or sixth marriage. Some of them have been to rehab about 15 times to get themselves off of uh, whatever they're on. It's like... I don't want to listen to somebody like that. I'm sorry. You know, I might get inspired by their achievements, and that's all very well. But, you know, we, 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 need, we need to listen to godly wisdom, godly, um, you know, godly thoughts and godly counsel. Um, as I say, you know, I'm a little bit disconnected from national news at the moment. I think I mentioned a while ago, I got a bit fed up after the last elections. I'm not interested anymore. It's just, I usually like to follow things. I just like, I'm sort of following, trying to follow sort of international um, affairs that are going on. So I'm a little bit informed, but come moving up to our next general election, I'll be very interested uh, again. And then I'll have some things to say. Right now, I'm a little bit disconnected, so I can't really comment on things too much other than uh, I'm not excited about the direction that we are going in. Uh, that's all I'm able to say. And uh, you see, there's godly wisdom for our own personal lives. There's godly wisdom for cities. There's godly wisdom for a whole nation. There's godly wisdom for the whole world. It's all available. But what are we listening to? What are we watching? Uh, which way are we going? Paul the Apostle gives us a list of eight things. Uh, eight things eight qualities that if thoughts match those eight, then uh, he says that, that that's what you ought to be thinking about. And you see, any thought that travels in our direction and hits our mind, it really only qualifies to remain there and be entertained in our mind if it meets that Philippians chapter 4 verse 8 test. And it's got those four areas here. Number one, true. Number two, noble. Number three, just. Number four, pure. Number five, lovely. Number six, good report. Number seven, virtuous. Number eight, praiseworthy. It's the Philippians chapter four, verse eight test. People talk about something, say, but it's true. Well, it might be true, but it's not lovely. And it's not just. As I said, the battle that's raging, and it's just suddenly heated up in our nation. As I say, I do see the headlines. It just read its head in our nation again. It's about abortion. Don't talk to me about women's rights over their body to be able to abort babies, and sometimes multiple times. Don't talk to me about that. That is just the height of selfishness. And any politician that wants my vote 
will have to turn pro-life. I don't care how good they are in other areas. If they're an abortion promoter, I'm not interested. And actually, Christians ought to be smart enough to not be interested either. Some fundamental anchor points for me personally. For a politician that wants my vote, they need to be pro-life. They need to be pro-Israel, not anti-Israel in its stance, because uh, Genesis chapter 12 tells us that any person, or for that matter, any nation that turns against Israel will inherit a curse. You know, they should be pro the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all very well to, uh, you know, to have freedom of religion, but gosh, if we're turning in any direction, then, it, you know, we ought to, like, you know, turn towards the kingdom of God. Whatsoever thinks is true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, praiseworthy. Think on these things. So this is one of the reasons why the Bible tells us to not spend any time and associate with gossips. See, people that gossip, they might bring things that are true. More often than not, it's not true. But sometimes it's true, and sometimes there would even be an element of truth in what they're saying. But it's not lovely. It's not just. It's not right to speak about other people in a derogatory sort of a way and to bring reports that the Bible says we ought not to bring. See, Proverbs 20, verse 19, it says, He who goes about as a slanderer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a gossip. In other words, don't hang out with such a person. Do not run with them. In fact, there is uh, certain groups of people, types of people that the Bible tells us to stay away from. Now, it's not to say we can't reach out to them, not to say that we, you know, we're still kind to them, but in terms of hanging out and relaxing and letting them influence us, the Bible says don't let them influence you in any way. You see, a gossiping person constantly speaks gossiping words because they constantly think gossiping thoughts. The gossip starts in their head. It didn't start with their mouth. It started in here. And what happens is that associating with a gossip will cause one's mind to be polluted with their gossiping thoughts. See, they think gossiping thoughts. They're trying to figure out whom else they can run down the next time they meet somebody and, and, and speak badly about, about them and everything. And then they verbalize those thoughts. And we hear those thoughts. We hear those words. The Bible says that the words of a talebearer, the words of a slanderer, the words of a gossip are like tasty muscles and they go down into the innermost parts. And I've been with people over the years, and I'm just sort of, I'm getting a little bit smarter. Uh, I've learned a few things over the years, you know, to stop people in their tracks. But it used to be in the early days, I'm, you know, get around people, and they all seem nice, you know. And, and some, people, some people have even learned to put a smile on their face and still pour out uh, poison with their mouth. A smile, but still pour out poison with their mouth. And then I'm left with that, like, gosh, I used to like that person that they talked about, and now I'm having problems liking that person because of everything that they told me. So, I, friends, let's not let our mind be polluted with gossiping thoughts from a gossip who is actually a slanderer. Just constant... We know what goes on in people's minds constantly because it comes out their mouth. You see, whether that's gossip, the Bible says don't associate with them. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15 says that bad company corrupts good morals. There are certain people I really enjoy being around and other people are like, oh, do we have to? <laughs> when specifically, the word tells me to not associate with them. <laughs> so, you know, just being careful. There's a few other categories of people that we ought not to hang out with. Uh, I haven't got time to get into the details of it. But, you see, uh, personally... Um, when I hang out with people, I, I like that list here that Paul brings in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. I like their conversation and their things to be true, noble, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, and praiseworthy. Because when I've been with them, 
When I've already worked hard to train my mind in that direction and I've been with them, I come away and my thoughts are still pure, lovely, true, good report and everything else. But when I've been with somebody and I come away and I think, like, it's almost like you feel like soiled, you know, you feel like all dirtied up by somebody. You know, they've come and they've dumped on you. Don't let them do that. And sometimes you get around, you get around the complainer Somebody that whinges and whines all day, every day. What is that? They're thinking, complaining thoughts all the time. And then as soon as they open their mouth, guess what comes out? Now, I know I'm re preaching really good today, but you're not giving me any credit. And you're starting to get uh, scarily quiet on me here. Just, uh, <laughs> you know whom, whom I'm talking about. And, and some of us have been there. But we're making an effort to train our thought and to just... You know, just, you know, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that murmuring and complaining is one of the five sins that kept the children out of the promised land. Just murmuring, whinging, whining. The Israelites, as a nation, there was obviously very good individuals in amongst them, but as a nation, the majority, they whinged against God, they whinged against Moses, they complained about the food, they complained about this and that. They're just always whinging. And why, why is that? That's the thoughts they think all day long. That's the meditation of their heart. It's not hard to figure out what's in people's minds. You just get with them long enough, and, 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 and if they're quiet, you poke them a little bit and see what comes out. <laughs> Are we doing all right this morning? <laughs> you see, changing one's bad thoughts with good thoughts is done by imposing God's thoughts on our mind through confessing the Word and meditating in the Word. Most of us have come out of the world and you know, if you were brought up in a good Christian home and you were trained well and your environment was one of, you know, true, uh, pure, lovely and everything, then, then you know, nowadays you, you, you've been the minority. And, and, and uh, so, so when we get born again, we, we, we all have to put th those, th those, that filter on and say, okay, okay, is this a good thought? Is this... Is this a, a God thought? Is it, is it a devil thought? You know, certain things we have to deal with and then we deal with it and move on. But in terms of what we meditate on and our self-talk that goes on, you, you see, it's not hard to figure out the self-talk of a person that, uh, that's forever feeling, you know, like feeling, you know, victim. Oh, nobody loves me. I just, you know, just, just that uh, self-pity. People think self-pity thoughts, guess what will come out of their mouth? It's self-pity words. And yes, many people have had a rough run in life and, and just, you know, just things hadn't gone that well for them. But you see, while they're wallowing in self-pity, and if that's what they think about, their mind is still the pivotal point of their life. It'll keep them where they are to make a change, to go in a different direction. You've got to just change your mind. You're no longer a victim. You're a victor. Um, we have the victory in Christ Jesus. God's made us the head and not the tail. I don't care what's been done to me in the past. I can take charge of my life and make a good go of it. And with the blessing of God, God can raise people up, from where, take them from where they've been and put them somewhere. But you've got to just let go of those old thoughts. So it's called the renewing of the mind with the Word of God. Renew the mind. Deuteronomy 13, uh, 11 verse 13. So God tells us here, He says, Pay close attention to my commandments that I'm giving you today. And love the Lord your God and serve Him with all your Mind. Here it is again. Serve him with all your mind and with your being. And then he specifies a few specific things. And then in verse 18, he says, Fix those words of mine into your mind. Fix those words of mine 
into your mind. You know, from time to time, I talk about the, uh, the Bible memory verse people called the navigators. I think they're still around today. I mean, in terms of a method of memorizing Scripture, which is what we're about to read here, uh, I mean, they are at the top end. Like, they, they don't just memorize a, a couple of verses. They memorize hundreds of verses of Scripture, and they have a method on how to do that. Uh, and, of course, one great method is to have little cards in your pocket and uh, pull them out during the daytime and just say that aloud and put it away again. I used to carry a little exercise book in my back pocket. Uh, just That was just before I went out the door. I always had my little exercise book with me. I mean, nowadays you've got electronic ga gadgets and apps and different other things, but that was just a little, one of those little red little exercise booklets. I always have it in my pocket. Uh, and I pull it out, and I'm working on a memory verse, and I pull it out, have another look, say it, and put it away again. And uh, because what, what, what was I trying to do? I'm, I'm trying to fix these words of God into my mind. That's the way to do it. You just bring it out again and, and have another look. And tie them as a reminder on your hands. And let them be symbols on your forehead. So the, and of course the, the Pharisees were the epitome of doing exactly uh, that in terms of all the external parts. You know, they literally used to wear on their hats. They had little uh, sort of little strings on their little boxes tied to their head. It's a bit like running around like crocodile Dundee, but rather than having corks attached to their head, they have little boxes attached with little scripture memory verses inside. But, but they didn't memorize them and they didn't live them. They only had them there. And, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, so, so fix these words of mine into your mind. You see, what's a good practice to do is to write scripture or otherwise print it out, whether you like it neatly printed or whether you write it, stick it on a piece of paper and put it somewhere prominent in your house. Like, like your, your, your bathroom mirror is a good place to put a scripture on there. If you're trying to change, well, you see, taking pertinent scriptures and fixing them in our mind, this is one of the ways to do it. And take a card with you and, and memorize and meditate on this thing and, and impress the Word of God on your thinking and what it'll do is it will eradicate the old thoughts and establish a new thought. It'll eradicate the old thought patterns and establish a new thought pattern. You see, the, the, the answer is not don't think bad thoughts. The answer is learn to think good thoughts and they will overpower the bad thoughts. It's replacing the replacement uh, methodology. You know, in, in, in Eastern type religion, when they talk about meditation, they say, empty your mind, empty your mind. That's the last thing you want to do. You don't want to empty your mind. Uh, you want to fill it with good things, and it will squeeze out, and it will force out, uh, uh, you know, the bad stuff and establish the new. So fix these words of mine into your mind. How do you do that? Memorize Scripture. Say, speak the word out aloud. Take even our victory program. Take that and, and make it a daily habit of taking one of the pages of that book, whatever you're working on, and begin to declare that out aloud. To begin with three times a day if you want to speed the process up. The more you speak the word, the more you meditate on it, the quicker you get there. You know, you pick that card up and say one scripture once every three weeks, then, you know... <laughs> You know, you know that that'll, you're not going to get there while you bombard your mind with all sorts of other nonsense and other, uh, other things. Deuteronomy 11, verse 19. Verse 20. Teach them to your children. Teach them. What, what, what is them? The, the words. God says, my words. Fix, you know, fix these words of mine into your mind. And now he says, teach them to your children. We don't do our children a favor if we don't teach them the word because they've got to do all the hard work later on. If, if that's how they, you know, if they end up in, in the kingdom of God, if they end up in, 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 in the church and so forth, as I say, it's, 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 you know, children come with a blank mind. 
Let, let's not let that mind be filled with all sorts of rubbish. There'll be plenty of rubbish that they will hear as they go about. Plenty of rubbish from the neighbor's kids, plenty of rubbish from the, from the school, um, in, in whatever environment that they're in. And teach them the word, teach them the word, teach them the word. God says, he says, teach them to your children and speak of them as you sit down in the house. So, so you're coming in, you're sitting down, and rather than complaining about how your day's gone, use the opportunity to speak a word of Scripture into your children. This is what God tells us to do, and speak that word. Sing the word. Parents of young children, sing to your children. Learn children's songs that are just Scripture put to song, to a melody, and sing them. It's amazing how that changes the atmosphere and how the children's hearts are lifted up and teaching the children how to be happy. Um, you know, as I say, sometimes bless people's hearts. People are struggling sometimes with depression and other stuff. You know, people grow up in a depressed environment. That's just what tends to happen. But to have a, have a positive and a buoyant, uplifting environment in your house. Be careful with the words that you speak in your house. Your house is your sanctuary. Don't pollute your, your atmosphere with bad words and with nonsense and with rubbish. And, you know, it's like just amazing today, uh, like, you know, with uh, how you can keep kids quiet for hours. It used to be just in front of television. Now it's got them little screens on them. And I'm all for it if there's all good stuff on there. But, you know, if they play witchcraft on there and they play, uh, you know, violent games and what have you, guess what's going to happen? And, you know, some of these cartoons, uh, you know, we've got a movie night coming up with a good theme and with good, positive, happy, happy things. Uh, in fact, some of those uh, movies, actually, I watched a couple of them, uh, uh, you know, these cartoon movies, and they're so happy. Now, I sit there as a, as a 61-year-old, and I enjoy the movie because it's happy, it's uplifting. And then you see a depressing one. I said, what is the point of that? And then you get some of these programs where it's just cartoon, just cartoon, just cartoon. And there's just accidents and calamity and um, unhappiness and, and American sarcasm. Uh, I'm, I'm not against the Americans. Americans are great people and great nation, but a lot of what comes out in terms of, of uh, you know, some of their entertainment and stuff, you, you got that sarcasm in there. Well, you know, sarcasm is something that's learned. Children don't, don't just suddenly come out with sarcastic comments all of their own. They've learned that from somewhere. And all of that hopelessness is, what is the point? You know, well, what's the point of life? Well, some of these cartoon movies, there's no point to life. It just goes from calamity to disaster to complaining to blowing up at each other and all, and go on and on and on, all on lovely little screens. Teach these things, God's Word. Teach them to your children. Speak of them as you sit down in your house, as you walk along the road. See, when you're out walking, use it as an opportunity to teach your children and as you lie down, and as you get up. Last thing in the evening, put a lovely thought into that child's heart. And there's no better lovely thought than Scripture. No better lovely thought. When they wake up in the morning, let the, let the first thought be a lovely thought. Scripture. Scripture in song. Uh, happy children's songs. Singing. You know, the simple things, Jesus loves me, this I know. I sing, I sing to the kids. And, uh, and it's amazing how an upset child, when you sing a happy song with a happy tune and with happy words, how it lifts them out and suddenly they're all mesmerized. <laughs> and sometimes the very little ones, uh, the grandchildren now, Vanessa and I no more children now, it's just, uh, <laughs> just grandchildren now. So the very little ones, I lie, them, I lie back or I lean back and I lie them on my, on my chest and I put the head like right there and sometimes I just hum a happy, a happy hum and they get all mesmerized by the vibration uh, and they just get all, you know, just, uh, just, uh, just they all just get happy, you know. So, so teach them to your children. Teach your children how to think. Get, get them out of, out of unhappy thoughts and unhappy state and... Uh, and uh, you know, I remember many years ago, the family, they had a child uh, was forever whinging and complaining and moping around. And, and I said, well, look, you know, you need to check up on what, uh, what, what the child's been feeding on. What, what, you know, in terms of, 
materials, entertainment, what's the child feeding on? But as it passed and beyond, if all the environment's right and you're creating a atmosphere and your child mops around and says, look, you know, this was a child that likes to socialize, says, you go into your room and don't you come out until you're happy. And the child go into the room for a while and then, you know, be by the door and want to come back out and, are you smiling yet? No, stay in your room. Uh, they said it, 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 in the end it worked like magic. It was just like, you know, the, the little one come out and you have a half a smile, say no, half a smile is not good enough. You go back in again and don't come out until you're smiling. And training the child and demanding, demand some things from your children. They're, they're capable of a lot more than what you realize. And in the end that was like the thing, that, do you want to go to your room? No, no, I'm happy, mom, I'm happy. <laughs> Now, because a child that's a loner, that's quite happy with their own company and everything, that's not going to work because going to the room is like heaven. You're like, this is wonderful. But a child that wants to be around other kids and everything else, and like, you know, this is, is possibly one way. It's just a little method that, you know, in that instance has worked well. So, praise God. Inscribe them, verse 20, on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. You know, I said earlier on, putting scripture around in prominent places in your house. This is where that comes from. God says, inscribe the word. Put a, put a verse up somewhere. So when you come home, you, you see it. When you leave the house, you see it. Uh, when you go, go to your mirror uh, in the morning, you see it. And, and when you know, sit there, wherever you sit, uh, uh, <laughs> wherever you stand, put a, put a scripture there. And that will help to train your mind to set your mind in the right direction, um, and particularly, what, what is an area that you are, you know, struggling with, and find a scripture that will deal with that very area, and you handwrite that thing. Even handwriting is like a form of meditation, and then say it out aloud, put it up somewhere. You'll recognize your own handwriting, and you walk past it, and you say it out aloud, and say, this is who I am, and this is what I do. And I get rid of the old and I establish the new. Very quickly now, last scripture, Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. This law scroll must not leave your lips. Here's God speaking to Joshua who's just taken over leadership from uh, Moses. And, uh, and, and Moses, of course, had written the scrolls, uh, had written Genesis Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and now it's Joshua. And God says to Joshua, okay, the scroll that Moses has given you, the Word of God, that's all the Word they had at that stage. We've got a whole Bible now, but they only had those first five books. Uh, and uh, and he, says, he says, that scroll, it must not leave your lips. Well, that's an interesting thing, because uh, he didn't say it mustn't leave your lips vicinity, he didn't say, mustn't leave your eyes. He says, you, you got to speak it. you got to speak it. Speak, speak the word. Because speaking the word will cause you to hear it, and it'll go in, and it'll overwrite whatever is there, and eventually become established as a thought, as a truth, uh, as, as, a, as a concept. He says, it mustn't leave your lips. You must memorize it day and night. Memorize. Uh, one translation says meditate in day. And how do you memorize? Uh, how do you rather, how do you meditate in something? You say it, you keep on saying it. In the process, you will memorize it. And then even if it's not immediately, excuse me, in front of your eyes, you can speak it out aloud. And, uh, and uh, I like to go to, 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 to retire in the evening with the last thought. I just meditate on Scripture. I just bring up. I've got certain favorites that I go to, uh, uh, whatever they are at the time, and then whatever is, is happening, just to meditate. Uh, could be Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. It could be Psalm 23. It could be, it could be anything. As I say, over the years, I've made an effort to uh, memorize Scripture, um, and, and they are my go-to things to meditate on rather than to meditate on something bad that's gone down or something bad that's happening. As I meditate in the Scripture because that strengthens me, that encourages me, um, and that equips me to take charge in my life. He says, you must memorize it day and night so you can carefully obey all that is written in it. Then you will prosper and be successful. So in closing, God tells us 
to replace our thoughts with his thoughts and with his words. You know, the spiritual discipline of speaking the word and meditating in it, speaking the word out aloud and, and, and memorizing it, fills our minds with God's thoughts and trains it to think godly thoughts. Our mind needs to be trained. It's like a horse that needs to be trained. And like, you know, things just need training. It's even a plant that you plant in your, you know, in, in, your, in your garden. Even that plant needs to be trained to just not head off in any old directions. Uh, a number of years ago, uh, I had this uh, tomato plant that I planted. And gosh, this thing took off in all directions. You even got to train that thing. Um, but gardeners understand that, but many people don't realize that their mind needs to be trained to think godly thoughts. We can deal with issues, even unpleasant things, and we deal with it. You know, it's not denial. It's not about, you know, just uh, sticking our hand in the sand and saying, oh, well, you know, we don't do that. Well, we deal with things. Whatever comes up, we deal with it. But our self-talk and our constant meditation is on the word, is on good things. Let's uh, bow our heads for a moment as we close with a word of prayer. Praise God. Father, we thank you once again. Lord, that you're teaching us how to love you with our mind. And Lord, you're giving us understanding that uh, when we think godly thoughts, you're pleased. And Lord, as we take your word and impress it on our minds and on our hearts, that is the meditation, Lord, that pleases us and that sets a new direction in our lives and takes us where you want us to go. We thank you, Father, for your plan and your purpose for every single person in the house here today. Lord, your plan and your person as far as, Lord, marriages are concerned. Your plan and your purpose as far as families are concerned, as far as careers are concerned. That, Lord, young people that are choosing a career, we thank you, Lord, that they're able to face the future fearlessly and think positive thoughts, Lord, about themselves, about their abilities, and about your goodness in, in their lives, Lord, that uh, will turn into a, a good, positive experience. And so, Father, we are once again grateful that you're teaching us, you're training us how to think happy thoughts and have a happy life, to think lovely thoughts and have a lovely life, to think kind and, and uh, patient thoughts to become kind and patient people. And God, we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.